Hi everyone. In this section we've got uh, a whole bunch of rules for calculating the derivative of a bunch of different functions. The good news is uh, for the most of the rest of this chapter I'm just going to be teaching you a whole bunch of rules and shortcuts so you don't have to use that limit definition to calculate the derivative anymore. So this one, while we still have to know how to use it for the AP test because it always shows up on one or two questions, Again, everything else is going to be shortcuts, so you can bypass that method. Uh, we've got three basic ones on the front page, and we've got two more complex ones on the following pages. The first one is called the constant rule, and it's the derivative of any constant function is zero. So constant function, that would be a horizontal line. And the reason why it's zero is because, well, remember, the derivative is just the slope of a function. And, well, wherever you've got a horizontal line, that doesn't change the fact that it's horizontal, so its slope is zero. So hopefully that rule makes sense to you. Um, horizontal lines have zero slope. So that's why that rule exists. Our next one um, is called the power rule, and it works with almost any exponent. So first I said positive integer here, and then I said also works for negative and rational. A better way to describe this would be if n, how about let's just stick it over here, n is a non-zero, so positive or negative, rational number. So you can express it, express it as a fraction. Then the derivative has one less in the exponent. And notice the exponent kind of comes down. We've observed this a few times. Uh, one of them I know of is on page 7. So if we go back, see how we had a cubic function and its derivative was quadratic? So we went from having something cubed to something squared. Now there may have been coefficients here. We don't know what these graphs are exactly. But that's the pattern that the power rule explains. And I'll show you how to work that one in just a second. Um, the, the last one here is the constant multiple rule, and we had a rule like this for limits. Whoops. Basically, if you have some constant number times a function, you're going to take a derivative of it. So if you have like c times f of x, and you're going to take the derivative of all that, that is the same thing as taking that constant multiple and multiplying it by the derivative of the function. You don't actually have to worry about that constant, whether it's 5 or 10 or negative 17 elevenths. You can just say, okay, I'm going to take the derivative of the function, then I'll remultiply it by this number. So let's, let's give you some examples here. So we have a linear function, y equals 3x plus 5, and the derivative, which we can notate as y prime, the prime being the derivative of y, um, we would use the power rule on this one. And the exponent on that x is really 1. right? So first off, I will bring the exponent down. So it'll be, see how I've got the exponent coming down here in the rule. So 1 times, I'm just going to bring the 3 along because of the constant multiple rule. And then I need to subtract 1 from the exponent on the x. So now I have x to the 0. And then we also have to think about the derivative of the plus 5. Well, 5 on its own is a constant, so its derivative is 0. So let's clean this up a little bit. Anything to the 0 power is really 1. So we're left over saying our slope here is just 3. Which that makes sense, right? That's why I chose to start with a linear function. You can see the slope here is 3. The y-intercept is 5. So it should make sense that the derivative everywhere is 3 because the slope of a linear function doesn't change. In example 2, we have a horizontal line. And according to the constant multiple rule, nope, that's not the rule. According to the constant rule, the slope of horizontal line is always 0, so its derivative, this the derivative of this function, would have to be 0. Our next one is quadratic, and if we think about what we've observed 
in previous lessons, we would be expecting a linear derivative. So let's see here. I'm going to use the power rule on the first two terms here because they actually have x's, and then I'm going to use the constant rule on the minus 4. So I'm going to bring the exponent down. So it's 3x squared. I'm going to bring down the 2. I'm going to keep the 3x, and I need to subtract 1 from the exponent. So 2 minus 1 is 1. Plus, I'm going to do the same thing for the 6x. It's really 6x to the 1. I'm going to bring down the 1. So it'll be 1 times 6 times subtract 1 from the exponent. And then the constant, just the regular constant rule, derivative of a constant is 0. So again, let's clean that up real quick. That would be 6x plus 6, which, hey, we had something quadratic. It ended up being linear. That works. Okay, this last one here is a little messy. It looks yucky, but I promise you it works just the same. The only thing you really need to do before you start working this problem is I would translate that radical into exponential form. And you know what? I would leave this exponent as negative. That's actually going to help you. In fact, I would rather have a negative exponent than 1 over x squared. I would rather leave it the way it was given in the problem. Okay, so square root is the same thing as having 1 half. So then, derivative using our power rule, let's bring down the exponent on the cubic term, keep the constant multiple, subtract 1 from the exponent, so 3 minus 1 is 2, minus, because there's a minus sign here, Okay, let's bring down the exponent on the next term. So that is minus 2x. Remember, you have to subtract 1 from the exponent. So this is what gets people sometimes. Negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3. So it doesn't always get closer to 0. It's just the rule is you've got to subtract 1. And then same thing for the last term. I'll keep the 7. Or actually, you know what? Let's do the, the rule first. So let's bring down the exponent of... 1 half, keep the 7, and then subtract 1 from the exponent. So 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half. Uh, so let's clean this up just a little bit. So 3 and 2 is 6 fifths on the x squared. We have a double negative here, so it would be plus. And now you could simplify if you want, so we could send the x cubed to the denominator. Uh, and 7 over 2 square root x. This would be our derivative. So can you imagine trying to calculate that with the original rule, the limit definition? Yuckers. I don't want to think about that. Okay, let's turn the page. Okay, up next we have the product rule. It's how you find the derivative when you have two functions multiplied together. So say you have some function, well, you have some equation. I don't know. Let's just call it e for equation. And you can break it down into being one function times another, and then you want the derivative of your original equation or function. Because there's two things in there, it gets a little more complicated. I prefer to think about it this way, but the textbook likes to use u's and v's, as you may have noticed on the previous page in some of our rules. There, there was a u and and whatnot. I don't like u's and v's because u's and v's are too similar and it forces you to actually put the tail on the u when I just want to write them like this. So it's really annoying. <clears throat> so we've got the derivative of our two functions multiplied. It comes down to you take the derivative of one function by itself, multiply it by the other original, then add, keep the original of the first one times the derivative of the second one. It's kind of a mouthful to remember. Uh, so I remember it like this. It's kind of like a, a chant. You might say, or, or, or sorry, you wouldn't say a chant. You would yell a chant at a football game or a basketball game. And it just goes like this. D, F, G, F, D, G, D, F, G, F, D, G, D, F, G, F, D, G, D, F, G, F, D, G. And just say it over and over and over again. You'll remember it forever. So it goes like this. D, F, G, F, D. And what it means is derivative of f i <coughs> times the original function g 
plus original function f times the derivative of the function g. Okay, so look at our equation here. We have y equals, and then we have two separate quantities that are multiplied together. This is textbook product rule, because we have a product in the function. So using my rule, we're going to, let's just call this first one f, and let's call this second one g. Or if you were following the original textbook rule, I would call the first one u and the second one v. Doesn't matter, whatever you want to do. Okay, so df, so derivative of the first one, so that would be, let's see, x squared, no, 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 don't want you to open up, 2x, and then the constant 1, well, derivative of the constant is 0, times original g, so x cubed plus 1, and then plus, now I'm going to keep the f part as its original, x squared plus 1, times the derivative of the g part, which, let's see, exponent rule, so bring the 3 down, subtract 1, and then the derivative of a constant is 0. So we can cut it off there. Great news. I'm not terribly interested in you simplifying things like that uh, because I know you know how to do it, or I know most of you know how to do it. So we can just leave it like that. I'm far more interested in your ability to do calculus than your ability to multiply things out. Let's take a look at the next one. So again, we have a product. Let's call the first part f, let's call the second part g, or again, if you want to use the textbook rule, you'd call this one u and this one v. And actually, you know what, why don't we rewrite this a little bit, because this does not look like it's in a helpful form. So like 3 over x, again, I would much prefer to work with a negative exponent than I would uh, have something in the denominator. So how about 3 times x to the negative 1 plus, and then you may find it helpful to do this at the start, Let's just call x divided by 3. How about let's call that one third x. So that'll be our f. And then for our g, again, don't want you to work with things in radical form. Let's switch that to exponential. So how about 2x to the 1 half minus 1. And that'll be our g. Okay, so again, following our rule, df, so derivative of f, that'd be, let's bring down the negative 1 in the exponent. Keep 3. Subtract 1 from the exponent. Be careful if it doesn't go to 0 here. Subtracting 1 takes you to negative 2. Plus uh, 1 times 1 third. Subtract 1 from the exponent. So there's your df. Our g would be the same. And then plus f. So now keep your f the same. 3x to the negative 1 plus 1 times the derivative of g. So let's see. Let's bring down the 1 half. Oh, whoops, forgot the 2. And again, subtract 1 from the exponent. And uh, the derivative of 1 is 0, so we don't need to worry about that. I do want you to clean this up just a little bit. I'm not worried about you multiplying it out again, but let's at least take care of some of the easy things like the 0 exponents and multiplying some of this stuff together. So how about, let's say the final answer is negative 3. You could even leave it with this negative exponent here. I don't, I don't care about that too much. Um, this one we don't really have to change at all. And then 1 half times 2 is 1. <coughs> Uh, so, do you have to show all this work every time with the x to the 0 and stuff? No, I'm just doing it to be super explicit uh, in our video here. This would be good for me. Oh, almost missed my derivative notation there. That's why prime. Okay, the last thing we're going to be working on today is called the quotient rule. So, on the previous page, we had the product rule where we had two functions multiplied together. Now, we're going to talk about taking the derivative when we have two functions divided. It doesn't matter what you put in the numerator, what you put in the denominator. Now, again, the book uses u's and v's to describe this rule. I always found it difficult to remember the rule when it was represented this way, because I couldn't remember what went first, u or v. So here's my suggestion for remembering this rule. When you need to take the derivative of some function divided by some other function, it just goes like this. Take the low function times the derivative of the high function, so the numerator, 
minus the pi function, the numerator one, times the derivative, whoops, we can just say d, of the low one, strike a line, square the low one. So I just said this to myself a hundred times when I was in high school, never forgot it. Low d high, minus high d low, strike a line, square below. And it works for me. So we got two functions here that we're going to work with. Um, so let's start with example seven. So um, let's just say my high is the numerator, my low is the denominator. Let's jump straight into the formula. You can use this if you like the u's and v's. Personally, I don't. So I'm just going to go straight to my sing-songy thing that helps me remember it. So low, square root of x, times the derivative of the function in the numerator, so high, um, 2x plus 1. So the derivative here would just be 2 minus the high function, so plus 1, times the derivative of the low function. Okay, now remember, square root of x, that's really x to the 1 half. So we'd have to use the power rule here. Bring down the exponent, subtract 1 from the exponent. Strike a line, square what's below. Again, you don't have to clean this up a whole lot. In fact, probably all I would do is just put the coefficients in front and undo the squaring and square root stuff. And this would be good. I don't need you to simplify this anymore. That's fine. Because that is something we can easily plug other numbers into and evaluate pretty quickly. <clears throat> and we got one more, and we'll wrap it up here. So again, we'll start, we'll just follow the, uh, the pattern. So low times d high, so derivative of the high, minus high d low, strike a line, square below. Mission accomplished. Okay, a couple thoughts for you. Um, if you're interested in the proofs on these rules, let me know, and we can look for some external resources. Um, I figured you would not want to watch a 15, 20-minute video on me just proving these to you. Um, and then also, I thought I'd show you a couple ways to check your answers while you're working. So this will work on any type of graph. Okay, so let's, um, let's just look at example 8 here to try it out. What you can do is in any graphing calculator, you can stick in the notation for the derivative and then plug in the original function. Whoops, I need to get this fraction. Okay, well, just roll with me. I'm going to figure it out. Okay. You got the ddx in front, I think. There we go. Okay. So there's my original function. This is telling the grapher to take the derivative of it, and you can just check it by plugging in what you got. So I know it's a long one because it's the, the quotient rule, but let's just try it. Divided by squared plus 4 squared. See how the graphs are the same if I turn off the blue one? Because they're the same, I know I did it correctly. You could do the exact same thing in your graphing calculator. Remember the uh, derivative notation. Oh, where is it? It's either in the menu key or the one next to 9, and I have to check every time. Here it is, this one. Yep, dx. And again, you plug in the function, and then you'd graph your answer. And as long as the graphs are on top of each other, mission accomplished. Last thing, if you have a full computer out and you don't want to use Desmos or you just want to do it a different way, there's this great website called Wolfram Alpha. Now, this sounds ridiculous. It is an amazing calculator. It can do so much stuff. Wolfram Alpha is actually the engine that powers Siri on your iPhones. It's really cool. So all you have to do is just tell it what you want it to do. So, for example, derive, and then plug in your function here. Now, you have because it's not as smart um, in the equation editor as Desmos, you'll have to maybe go a little crazier with your parentheses. But... Uh, Wait for it, wait for it. Now, of course, it's going to simplify it for you, but you could still check it. Um, if you pay for the app, I think it's like $4 on an iPhone or Android. Honestly, great use of $4 for me. Um, you can even click this button here. And again, on the app, if you pay for it, they'll show you how to get there step by step, which is awesome. 
Okay, that's it for today. See you tomorrow.